Hey guys, I, I know that many of you give when you're at the church, but due to COVID, we are still dealing with a situation where more people are staying home than are getting out. Uh, please continue to give to the church, even while you are unwilling or simply unable to attend. Being a small church, that's a very small amount, but it's necessary for us to afford rent, utilities, and to be able to broadcast as we do. You can give online at www.calvarybirmingham.com. When you're there, just click on Give. Or you can mail in a donation. 1738 Morgan Park Road, Pelham, Alabama, 35124. Thank you very much and God bless you. The world is spinning and I'm dizzy staring at the stars. I left the pages in my schedule but they're falling hard. Find me on your way out, I'll be right here. part instead Don't know what to say now I'll get my eyesight checked previous two chapters, we had a genealogy of Jesus following the line of Joseph, that is Jesus' legal father, through David's son Solomon. And by starting his gospel with this genealogy, Matthew reminded his readers of the promises of God as well as announcing their fulfillment. But it would take more than human pedigree to qualify Jesus as the promised Messiah. Divine heredity was important, and Matthew addressed Jesus' divine heredity by telling us how Joseph and Mary were betrothed, but not yet together. And she was with child of the Holy Spirit, and how Joseph had been told by an angel of the Lord that Mary had conceived of the Holy Spirit. So he was instructed to name the child Jesus and told that Jesus would save his people from their sins. Matthew then goes on to tell how the child was born in Bethlehem of Judea in fulfillment of prophecy. And when he was just under two years old, a group of wise men from the east arrived, having been guided by a star. They came to worship him and they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These gifts announced their flight to Egypt or these gifts financed, excuse me, financed their flight to Egypt when warned by an angel that Herod was going to try to kill Jesus. Either a few weeks, months, or no more than two years after Herod's death, Jesus' family left Egypt and made their way home um, to Israel and specifically made their home in Nazareth. Now there's a lot more to the first two chapters, and if you miss those messages, I would suggest that you go back and that you watch and you listen to them. But that quick review suffices for us to continue on into chapter 3. Now between chapters 2 and 3, about 28 years pass. And very little is known about Jesus' childhood. The Bible is mostly silent about it. We have some brief glimpses in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, however. Um, there in verse 40, we read, The child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. We also know from Luke 2 that his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. Presumably, they always took Jesus with them. Now, Luke says that there was this one time when they lost Jesus while in Jerusalem for Passover. When they found him, he was in the synagogue, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening and asking questions. He was only 12 years old, but Luke tells us that all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. 
Now, aside from this, the Bible does not reveal anything about Jesus' childhood. I, I think we can safely make some assumptions, however. First, we can assume that Jesus grew up in a good home, who had good parents who loved him. Luke says that Jesus was subject to his parents, meaning he was obedient to them. Jesus, uh, also, we can, we can assume that Jesus was fulfilling the duties of an oldest son. Now, as we noted last week, it seems that Joseph, uh, his father, died before the family had grown up. And we know from the Gospels that Jesus had younger siblings, brothers and sisters. And Jesus is referred to in Matthew 13 as son of the carpenter. So Joseph was a tecton, usually translated as carpenter, but not exclusive of uh, working with stone or, or even working with metal. Jesus would certainly have learned to work in his father's vocation as he grew up, so it's safe to assume that with the passing of Joseph, that is, with the father of the family now gone, Jesus as the eldest son would have worked to support his family. He probably taught his brothers and sisters carpentry as well. There are a lot of vision-casting pastors out there who will try to tell you that to follow Jesus and to please God, you must dream big and live out some great dream destiny. And, and to do a good work is to pursue that God-sized dream, willing to sacrifice everything else to do it. But that is strictly unbiblical. And Jesus is the great example of one who for a season accepted the simple duties of the home. Jesus did not come into a, a cushioned life, but worked. And he worked hard, performed tedious and menial tasks. He lived the simple life of a regular person, and through this, he identifies with the regular person. So in the silent years, Jesus lived just as you and I, only without sin, faithful in the little things. Scripture does not say it quite in this way, but having passed on his, fa his earthly father's vocation to his brothers, there came a day where he set that aside to do that which his heavenly father sent him to do. And that is where we pick up here in chapter 3. This chapter brings us to the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this brand new morning. Thank you for the breath you've placed in our lungs. We thank you for the beating of our hearts. You are the living God who is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounds in steadfast love. And we ask as we enter into the study of your written word that you would give us wisdom and understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, verse 1 of Matthew chapter 3 begins this way. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who, is, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So John the Baptist he was born to Zechariah and Elizabeth six months prior to Jesus' birth to Mary. Now, the birth was miraculous, not in the same way as Jesus born to the Virgin Mary. Rather, as Luke 1 tells us, he was born to elderly parents who had never been able to have children. Now, the angel Gabriel announced to Zechariah, a Levitical priest, that he would have a son. And also in Luke 1, it's recorded that Gabriel said this about John. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. God selected John to be the special ambassador to proclaim the coming of the Messiah. And true to the word of the Lord, Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, gave birth to John. At this time, the Jews were very aware that the voice of the prophet spoke no more. In fact, for 400 years, there had been no prophet. But in John, in John the prophetic voice again spoke. And he was the first prophet called by God since Malachi. 
John's ministry was foretold over 700 years previously by the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, we read this, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. There had been expectations of an Elijah-type figure who would proceed and pave the way for the Messiah. And while Jesus, Matthew, and the other apostles recognized John the Baptist as the fulfillment of the return of Elijah, Jews who reject Jesus do not. And even to this day, while celebrating Pesach or Passover, a family will set one extra plate setting with a cup of wine before it in expectation of none other than Elijah to appear. And at the pouring of the last cup of wine, a child is asked to get up and open a door, hoping for Elijah's return. The extra cup set for Elijah and the open door is a declaration of hope that he would soon arrive to announce the coming of the Messiah. But because they rejected Jesus, they missed both, no Elijah and no lamb. In fact, most observant Jews today will not have lamb on their Passover plate. Instead, they will have a dry bone, because with the temple, there is no sacrifice. After, um, without the temple, there's no sacrifice. After Jesus' sacrifice, there was no more need for the temple. And so in 70 AD, God allowed it to be completely destroyed by the Roman army. So again, because they rejected Jesus, they miss Elijah, and more importantly, they have no lamb. Now back to our text and the idea that John fulfilled the prophecy about Elijah. Elijah was described in 2 Kings as a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. And here we find John the Baptist clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. Like Elijah, he lived in the wilderness and his food was locust and honey. The word for locust here is akri and it speaks of a, a, an insect we might call a grasshopper, though a bit larger than what we typically you know, have around here in, in Alabama. Luke, Leviticus 11 tells us that they are, according to the law, clean for food. And wild honey tells us that John collected his own honey from nests he found in the wilderness. Perhaps he added the honey to the locusts, or perhaps the locusts were the main course and you know, honey than the dessert. But more important than what he ate was what John did. According to the text here, he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now Luke 3 tells us that this was in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. The 15th year would be around AD 26 to 28. Tiberius was the emperor at the beginning of Christ's ministry and would continue to be at the time of Christ's uh, crucifixion. Luke 3 also tells us that the Roman governor of Judea was Pontius Pilate. Other historical facts are also found in Luke 3, but other than the fact that Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, most pertinent to our study at this point is what it says about John the Baptist. Luke 3 says that he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, and that his ministry was to prepare the way of the Lord. So John's ministry involves several things. Denouncing evil. It didn't matter how powerful or threatening, John did not hold back from the, from the Tetrarch Herod to, as we'll see in a few verses, the Pharisees and the Sadducees the powerful religious leaders of the day. John just didn't hold back. He urgently called men and women to repent, to turn to God and to live godly lives. And he directed people to God and to the Christ, not to himself. He was not the spectacle, but instead he pointed the people to Jesus. In our text in Matthew, John's message said that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what does this mean? Should the people have been looking around for a kingdom to just suddenly appear, a, a political savior coming to throw off Rome and establish a great Israelite kingdom? Well, we get a clue about what this means from Jesus himself in Luke 17, where responding to Pharisees who were always poking and prodding to find weakness in Jesus, asked when the kingdom of God would come. And Jesus responded, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or therefore, indeed, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Several translations, including the New King James Version, 
render in your midst as within you. But that is, a, that is really a terrible translation, seeing that Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. Instead, antos human is much more logically translated among you as the New English translation or the Net Bible renders it. The reference is to Jesus being in their midst. So John the Baptist was preaching about the Messiah who was now with them and preparing the people for the beginning of Christ's ministry. Part of that was his ministry of baptism. John was called the Baptist. Well, because that's what he did. He proclaimed the need for repentance, the coming of the kingdom of heaven, and baptized people in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. The baptism of John was for those who knew that they missed the mark. It was a baptism of declared repentance. And repentance will always precede one's reception of Jesus as Savior because biblical repentance is a mind change about God, who he is, and what that means to us in light of our sin. The physical act of being ceremonially immersed in water was not something that was new. It had been practiced for centuries. There were deep pools called mikvaot, uh, which means collection of water, at the temple, which were used for ceremonially cleansing before entering the temple grounds. The idea was spiritual purification and cleansing before coming into contact with that which was holy. But the baptism of John was not at the temple. It was in the wilderness at the Jordan River near where Israel would have first crossed over into the promised land. It's referred to as the baptism of John in Acts, which was a baptism of preparation for the Messiah. Now, after Christ, Christian baptism became a one-time symbol of cleansing and identification with Christ. And in Christ, believers are made clean once for all, and a single baptism is the symbol for that. It is an act of obedience to Christ and identification with him that is a fruit of salvation. In other words, everyone who confesses Christ should be baptized. Jesus began his ministry with his own baptism, and he, before ascending, gave us orders to continue to baptize. And if you have not been baptized, most certainly I would be honored to do so. Now, some churches today require baptism to become a member of their church, even if you have been baptized already. That is, baptized. they, they ask you to be baptized into the fellowship of the church. But the intent of baptism is not to join the local fellowship but it is an act of obedience and is a picture of identification with Christ. We could get even deeper into this, but you know, let's save all that for later. All right, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, in Hebrew, the Pharisees were called Perashim, the Sadducees were called Zedukim. And we see these two groups a lot in the Gospels as Jesus was in almost constant uh, conflict with them. These were people of the ruling class in Israel. The Sadducees were primarily of the governing classes of the wealthy priests. Now, the name Sadducees derives from the Hebrew word for righteous ones or Zedukim. Their tradition is traced back to Zadok, who was a priest at the time of David, and a supporter of Solomon during the struggle for succession after David died. Now, the Essenes, a sect associated with the area of Qumran, and of course the Dead Sea Scrolls from that area, may also have identified themselves with this priest Zadok, though they themselves were not Sadducees. Um, and it's interesting that, that the outlook and customs of the Essenes, of the Essenes seemed very much like John the Baptist. And so perhaps he was an Essene, or perhaps he identified with the Essenes. But the Essenes and the Sadducees certainly did not identify with one another, nor did John the Baptist identify with the Essenes. Now the Sadducees are a bit difficult to nail down because none of the writings of the, of the Sadducees have been found intact. Um, but it's generally understood that they favored an interpretation of the scriptures that said there was no afterlife and thus no resurrection. Now, Jesus would counter their rejection of the resurrection by pointing out to them that scripture says what God, the, scripture says that God is 
that is not was, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, Jesus told them that God is a God of the living and not the dead. Now, many of this group were wealthy, and the Sadducees occupied the majority of the seats of the Sanhedrin, that is, the supreme court of ancient Israel, which was made up of 70 men and the high priest who met at the temple in Jerusalem. Now, the Sadducees and the Pharisees did not get along. They were frequently trying to have their rulings on the scriptures enforced as law. It was the Sanhedrin that would hold the mock trials that, that, that brought about the demand that Pontius Pilate should crucify Jesus. And this friction between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, however, did not prevent them from teaming up in their desire to accuse Jesus. The Pharisees we know a bit more about. Their writings have survived, and, and the Bible as well as historians like Josephus reveal much more about them. The beliefs of the Pharisees were the immortality of the, of the soul, uh, the existence of angels, uh, divine providence and freedom of will, in resurrection of the dead, and in the oral Torah. Now, you might hear this and think, hmm, that seems to line up with much of what I believe. Well, of these two groups, Jesus would probably have identified closely with the Pharisees and many of his teachings do, in fact, line up with what the Pharisees taught. Now, the term Pharisee has taken on the meaning of one who is a hypocrite. But did you know that their own writings recognized their hypocrisy? They were often very critical of themselves. Certainly, there were many within the ranks of the Pharisees that were insincere, but there were also those who were quite sincere, as we will see today. And it was Jesus' closeness to the Pharisees that allowed him to speak into their lives so much more than he could the Sadducees. In fact, Jesus told the people to do what the Pharisees teach, but not what they do, pointing out the hypocrisy that was, in fact, within their ranks. The Pharisees believed that at the time God gave the written Torah, he also gave an oral Torah. In other words, as God gave and Moses wrote down the Torah, God also verbally expounded and explained it, which was not written down at the time, but handed down orally. And the Pharisees believed both to be equally God's law. When the oral tradition was finally written down, it was called the Talmud, and it is actually 50 times larger than the Torah. The Essenes did not like the idea of an explained oral Torah because they said it softened the Torah and led to lenient rulings. The Sadducees did not hold to the two Torahs either, only the written Torah, and they also did not recognize any scripture besides the Torah. Now, other distinctives of the Pharisees were their observation of ritual purity, not only in the temple, but also at home, and also faithful giving of tithes and offerings, something Christians today are often hypocritical about, saying they give when in fact they give what is left over rather than giving sacrificially. They also held to the strict observation of the Sabbath. You may recall that the Pharisees took issue with Jesus' disciples not keeping the elaborate traditions of ritual washings and also their plucking of grain from fields on the Sabbath. The Pharisees were very much about the keeping and the traditions, but they did so for the recognition and the sake of the keeping. They had been more interested, or had they been more interested in clean hearts than they were in clean hands, they would have recognized the intent of the law rather than just the rote keeping of it. Now, in our text, John the Baptist recognized many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to hear him. They were not seeking to repent or participate in his baptism of repentance. Instead, they were as vipers among the flock, ready to spread their poison. And John calls them out, but then he speaks of wrath to come. These religious leaders perhaps did not think of themselves as being absent from sin, but they thought of themselves as being less sinful than others. Now, John is essentially grouping them together with all the others that were there, sinful and in need of repentance. That is, they were in the same boat as everyone else. Verse 8, Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say of, to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able <coughs> to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. 
Now, in the wilderness where John's ministry took place, short, dry grasses would often ignite in the heat and either drive out or consume the animals that lived there, such as vipers. And so if the Pharisees and Sadducees are really coming for baptism, they are like the animals scurrying for life before a desert fire or in front of the sickle of the harvester. But John knows they come as vipers. Now, in the ministry of Jesus we at times find the religious leaders appealing to their having descended from Abraham. But here at the very start of Jesus's ministry, John the Baptist warns them that pleading that Abraham is their father will not get them anywhere with the Lord. To Jews, Abraham was unique. It was believed that Abraham was so unique in his goodness and in his favor with God that his merits suffice not only for himself, but also for all of his descendants. So the Pharisees and Sadducees believed that simply because they were Jews and not for any merits of their own, they were safe from wrath with a set inheritance in the world to come. Now it's this false idea which John is rebuking, saying in verse 9 that children of Abraham are not unique. In fact, as we know, Abraham is the father of many nations. It's not the lineage of Abraham that ushers them into the family of God. Abraham is not their passport to heaven. Neither does social standing have anything to do with it, nor is it works. Works in no way merit you entrance to heaven. But if there are no works in your life that demonstrate your salvation, you might need to to be concerned. Once we begin feeding our flesh with its desire of works-based salvation, it becomes difficult to change. It would be easier for God to raise children from the rocks as our hearts have become as stone. Verse 10, and even now the axe is laid to the roots, to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John the Baptist at this point had a big reputation and quite a bit of influence. Yet he said that he was not fit to carry the sandals of the one who was to come. And to carry sandals was the duty of a servant. At the very peak of his ministry, John directed people's attention off of himself into elsewhere. He pointed beyond himself to the one who was to come. His only importance, as he saw it, was was as a signpost pointing to the one who was to come. He said that the one who was to come would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The prophets had predicted the outpouring of God's Spirit on the righteous at the time when when God established his kingdom for Israel. Ezekiel heard God say, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will pour my spirit on your descendants. And Joel heard, afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. John the Baptist was Jewish, and the people he was speaking to were Jewish. They were accustomed to the idea of a ritual cleansing, but John's baptism was not for entrance to the temple. It was to prepare them for an even greater event. And when they heard him speak another to, of another to come who would baptize in the Holy Spirit, they might have thought of, of Ruach as breath or as wind or that the Spirit of God is connected to creation. The Spirit of God also brought God's truth and enables people to recognize God's truth. But the baptism of the Spirit, which John speaks of, was more than they could understand. For it was baptism into Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within leading us into all truth and sealing us as holy to the Lord. To this point in history, the Holy Spirit had operated from the outside. There were special instances where prophets were filled with, with the Spirit to prophesy on behalf of the Lord. But with the death, resurrection, and ascension of, of Christ, all believers would be permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. As Paul wrote to the Ephesian believers in Ephesians 1, 13-14, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, 
in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So the, to the Jewish ear, hearing John speak these words, he was saying that the Messiah is at hand and everything is about to be turned upside down and uprooted. A great testing was about to begin. Don't be fruitless, don't be found fruitless when the landowner comes to test his trees. Instead, repent and bear fruits worthy of repentance. The dead, fruitless ones will be cut down and destroyed. So while the promise of baptism in the Holy Spirit was a blessing, there's a warning of judgment here because Christ will also baptize with fire. Fire speaks of judgment, and this is the judgment to come. The Bible tells us that all humanity will be judged, and they will be judged by God the Son, Jesus Christ. And the Gospel of John tells us in chapter 3 that the basis of God's judgment will be their relationship to Christ. John 3, 18 through 19, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he does, who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Where a person spends eternity depends upon whether they have received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Judgment will be fair, however, and everyone will be judged according to their works. Those who receive Jesus as Savior will not be condemned. As 1 Corinthians 3 tells us, their works will be judged through fire, either to be rewarded or to burn up and be lost. Again, they're saved, but works are judged and rewarded or not rewarded. Those who reject his free gift of salvation will be condemned for all eternity. But because judgment is fair, they will be judged on the basis of their works. However, outside of the grace of God that we receive through faith in Christ, no matter how wonderful our works may be in the eyes of man, our works are tainted by sin and will not survive the fire of purification. And being judged by his works, the individuals will find themselves condemned by his works. And, and as, as we saw in our study through Revelation, the destination of all who are not saved is the fires of hell. And so John uses the illustration of the threshing floor. And in his illustration, the fan that John spoke of was a large wooden shovel. With it, the grain was lifted from the threshing floor and tossed into the air. And when that was done, the heavy grain fell to the ground, but the chaff, which is lighter than the grain, was blown away by the wind. The grain was then collected and stored in the barns, while any chaff which remained was collected and burned. The coming of Christ necessarily involves a separation. People either accept him or they reject him. And it is precisely that choice which settles destiny. People are separated by the reaction to Jesus in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry, in the days of the apostles preaching Christ, and of course, still today. All right, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. So as we, as we observed earlier, Jesus was living in Nazareth of Galilee. He was working as a craftsman and teaching his brothers the trade. From Nazareth to the area of the Jordan River where John the Baptist operated was about a distance of 60 miles. When Jesus came to John to be baptized, John was startled and unwilling to baptize him. John said that it was he who needed what Jesus could give, not Jesus who needed what what he could give. People have often found the baptism of Jesus difficult to understand. That's because John's baptism was a call to repentance and preparation for Christ. But here was Jesus, who was without sin and thus had no need to repent. So how was this applicable to Christ himself? Well, first it demonstrated approval of John's baptism, that, that it was of God, that repentance was an important part of coming to Christ. Second, it allowed John the Baptist to fulfill his ministry by pointing to Christ as the Lamb of God, the one whom he had been preaching of and preparing people to receive. So John was presenting Jesus to the people. And also John was of the priestly line. He was of the tribe of Levi and a direct descendant of Aaron. 
it was a duty of priests to wash and present sacrifices before the Lord. Jesus had been born as prophesied, at the time prophesied, in the place prophesied, kept in the house as the Passover lamb would be. And the Gospel of John tells us that upon seeing Jesus, John the Baptist proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Bible, or the Passover lamb was the animal God directed the Israelites to use as a sacrifice in Egypt on the, the night God struck down the firstborn sons of every household of Egypt as recorded in Exodus 12. God told the Israelites that every one of their households was to select a year-old male lamb without defect. The father of the house was to kill the lamb at twilight, taking care that none of its bones were broken, and apply some of its blood to the tops and sides of the, of the doorframe of the house. God said that when he saw the lamb's blood on the doorframe of the house, he would pass over that home and not permit the destroyer to enter. But any home without the blood of the lamb would have their firstborn son struck down that night. And this was predictive of Christ, a picture of what Christ would do. Christ, as John the Baptist declared, is the Lamb of God. Paul the Apostle wrote, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the book of Revelation saw Jesus as a lamb as though it had been slain. And of course, Jesus was crucified during the time that the Passover was observed. And the Bible in Hebrews says that believers have symbolically applied the sacrificial blood of Christ to their hearts and thus have escaped eternal death. The Passover lamb's applied blood caused the destroyer, the destroyer to pass over each house, household. Christ's applied blood causes God's judgment to pass over sinners and gives life to believers. So you see that the Passover lamb was a foreshadowing of the better and the final Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. Verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The voice heard at the baptism of Jesus is of great importance. There are three occasions on which the Bible records the Father speaking within the Gospels, speaking from heaven. Here in our text at Christ's baptism, um, of course, then there's also the transfiguration. At the time of the transfiguration is recorded in Matthew 17. And as Christ approached the cross is recorded in John chapter 12. Now, speaking of what the Father says here, it echoes Psalm chapter 2. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. You are my son, but the second part is left off. That's because, as we know from Acts 13, his begetting refers to his resurrection from the dead. And so we find that this statement from the Father ties in perfectly with the picture painted in baptism of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. But the Father's statement also relates Jesus Christ to the suffering servant that was prophesied in Isaiah chapters 40 through 53, humble, rejected, made to suffer and die, but also victorious. We should also note that here at the beginning of Jesus's earthly ministry, we have the full representation of the Holy Trinity. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, you would think that everyone there would be, would at the moment God said this, have, have dropped everything to follow Jesus. But next week in chapter 4, we'll find Jesus led by the Spirit into the wilderness alone to endure temptation. Now, we're going to stop here, but the question we might all need to ask ourselves may not be, have you confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior, though that is the most immediate, most important thing that we should be asking ourselves, but also we should perhaps ask ourselves, are you following Jesus? We criticize the Pharisees as being hypocrites. But perhaps first we look at ourselves. Are we being faithful in the little things? Or do we just say that we're doing those things? And finally, are we disciples? Or do we just say that we are disciples? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. 
Lord, we thank you for who you are. And Lord, we thank you that you have saved us, not by any merit of our own, but simply by grace through faith. Lord, we pray that your name would be holy, that your name would be holy in our hearts, that your name would be holy in the hearts of all the world. As a church body, we desire your kingdom and we seek to do your will. We know that you have provided for us in the past, Lord, and we know that you will continue to provide. Um, and, and you provide always according to our needs. We thank you, Lord, for you alone are wise, Lord. We believe we, we should have certain things, Lord, and you know that those things are detrimental to us, and you hold them back. And you give us those things that we need instead. That is in your wisdom, your divine wisdom, and we thank you for that. You protect us, you keep us. Lord, as you love us, we ask you would teach us how to love one another as you have forgiven each one of us of so much. Lord, help us to be as forgiving toward others. Lord, help us to have our treasures in heaven rather than seeking after ourselves here on earth. We ask that you would establish us in all of your good things, Lord, and that you would guard our hearts and keep our hands from evil, that you would protect us from the deceptions of our enemy, the devil. We thank you, Lord, even through our trials. We thank you that you are a great high priest. We place ourselves before you to do your will. We ask that you would lead us in victory and use us to spread knowledge of Jesus Christ to the unsaved world. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. That's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message from the Bible. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that the end result of sin is judgment and condemnation. But God graciously provides the means to you to be forgiven and to be saved. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, taking the punishment that you deserve. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You receive the free gift of salvation in Christ by faith. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've done terrible things in my life, but I know that I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what you have done, you can be too. For the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So please, don't put it off. Take this moment. To confess Jesus. I'm closing chapters, looking backwards, and I'm making sense. I'm interested in all that flourishes from ignorance.